Hello. In this episode of An Approach to Symptoms, I'll be discussing an approach to acute diarrhea. As with other videos in this series, this will focus on adult and teen patients. It does not completely apply to younger pediatric age groups. To begin, how do we define acute diarrhea? Well, even for the one word diarrhea, medicine does not have a uniform definition. Labeling a person's bowel movements as diarrhea can be based upon the number of them within 24 hours, the stool volume within 24 hours, or their subjective consistency. While there are published definitions that are more specific than this, for example, exactly how many bowel movements or what precise stool volume is necessary, in practice, we typically just take the patient's word at face value. If they come reporting diarrhea, they have diarrhea with the one caveat that one occasionally needs to distinguish diarrhea from fecal incontinence, which is an entirely separate problem, but which some patients will sometimes interpret as diarrhea. Regarding whether the diarrhea is acute, once again, there is no uniform definition for this, but most commonly, diarrhea is considered acute if it has been present for less than two weeks. When it comes to a diagnostic framework for diarrhea, whether we are discussing acute or chronic, there are two major categories. Non-inflammatory diarrhea consists of watery stool, which may or may not be associated with abdominal pain. Fever and sepsis are relatively uncommon. In contrast, inflammatory diarrhea is likely present if the stool has gross blood or mucus. Inflammatory diarrhea usually presents with concurrent abdominal pain and fever and or signs of sepsis are relatively common. Acute inflammatory diarrhea is sometimes known as dysentery. I actually discourage the use of this word in the absence of a specific microbial diagnosis since it strongly implies an infectious etiology, which is usually, but not always the case. Although the corresponding video on an approach to chronic diarrhea also discusses the distinction between osmotic versus secretory versus malabsorptive versus hypermotility types of diarrhea, that paradigm does not apply well to acute diarrhea. Moving to specific etiologies, non-inflammatory diarrhea can be caused by viruses, including norovirus, rotavirus, enteric adenoviruses, cytomegalovirus, which is primarily seen in patients with significant immunocompromise, and as most recently observed, SARS-CoV-2, or the virus responsible for COVID. Bacterial etiologies include C. difficile, an important bacteria that classically causes diarrhea following antibiotic usage, which can feel a bit paradoxical, but what happens is antibiotic therapy substantially reduces the load of so-called good bacteria in the gut. Since C. diff is not affected by most antibiotics, any C. diff bacteria present at the time will flourish in the absence of competition for nutrients. The highest risk antibiotics for causing C. diff colitis are clindamycin, fluoroquinolones, broad-spectrum penicillins, and third-generation cephalosporins. E. coli, specifically the enterotoxigenic, enteropathogenic, and enteroaggregative subtypes. The distinguishing clinical pathologic and epidemiologic features of the five major pathologic E. coli subtypes is a complicated subject which is outside the scope of this video, and their categorization is not as clear-cut as this chart will imply. Other bacteria in this category include Listeria, Vibrio cholera, which is responsible for the disease cholera, which is associated with huge outbreaks in areas of war and natural disaster, and Vibrio parahemolyticus. So far, all of these bacteria have caused diarrhea through infection within the GI system. But some bacteria can cause diarrhea not through direct infection, but rather by creating preformed toxin in food prior to consumption. And it's the ingested toxin that actually causes illness. Bacteria which are infamous for doing this include Staph aureus and B. cereus. Features of the presentation that suggest toxin ingestion to be the mechanism of illness are nausea and vomiting that begins within a few hours of food ingestion and which is more prominent and begins before the diarrhea. Although a large number of protozoa can cause diarrhea, the most common are giardia and cryptosporidium, 
Not all non-inflammatory diarrhea is infectious in origin. Non-infectious causes of acute non-inflammatory diarrhea include medications. The most commonly implicated are antibiotics. Antibiotic-associated diarrhea is caused by disruption of normal gut flora, but it does not necessarily lead to C. diff colitis. Specifically, most diarrhea that is triggered by antibiotics is not C. diff, even though it is important to test for C. diff in this situation. Other common drug culprits include antineoplastic drugs, colchicine, NSAIDs, magnesium-containing antacids, PPIs and H2 blockers, and the SSRI class of antidepressants. Lastly, psychosocial stressors can also lead to acute diarrhea. When it comes to inflammatory diarrhea, it can be caused by a wide variety of bacteria, including enteroinvasive and enterohemorrhagic subtypes of E. coli, the latter of which is sometimes used synonymously with the term shigatoxin-producing E. coli, though a microbiologist might split hairs here and point out that EHEC is technically a subgroup within STEC. EHEC includes the particularly dangerous E. coli subtype O157H7, which is associated with an acutely life-threatening condition called hemolytic uremic syndrome. Other bacteria here include Campylobacter, Shigella, Yersinia, and non-typhoido salmonella. The major protozoa, which is associated with inflammatory diarrhea, is Entamoeba histolytica. Regarding non-infectious inflammatory diarrhea, a relatively uncommon but important cause in hospital medicine is ischemic colitis. This is a good place to mention that any cause of chronic diarrhea can present acutely, so the entire list of etiologies for chronic diarrhea could be considered within this whole chart as well. However, most causes of chronic diarrhea typically have a gradual onset, such as seen with most malabsorption syndromes, whereas the relatively rapid onset of diarrhea can be seen with a first presentation of inflammatory bowel disease. Another important point is that these two broad categories are not precise. For example, pathogens that are more classically associated with inflammatory diarrhea can cause watery diarrhea early in their course, and severe C. diff infections along with all forms of E. coli can be associated with sepsis. Overall, the most common causes of acute diarrhea in both the United States and the rest of the world is believed to be norovirus. Other common causes are the various subtypes of E. coli and Campylobacter. In the developing world, other particularly notable pathogens include Vibria cholera, Shigella, and Entamoeba. An identification of the specific pathogen causing acute diarrhea is not always critical, but there are some classic associations between epidemiology and clinical features and a suggested organism. I won't read through this chart for you, but you can pause the video and read through it if you'd like. There is one particular form of, of acute diarrhea which is worth mentioning separately, traveler's diarrhea. As name implies, this is diarrhea that develops while a person is traveling out of the geographic area in which they normally reside, classically involving travel to a resource-limited location with suboptimal sanitation. Risk factors for developing it include travel during the warm and wet season, buying food from street vendors, and consuming salads and raw vegetables. Common etiologies for traveler's diarrhea include enterotoxic E. coli, Campylobacter, and neurovirus. Although it's very common, luckily it is usually relatively mild and self-limited. I'm going to bring it back to discussing the general assessment of an undifferentiated patient with diarrhea. What are the things that you'll want to ask about during the history? How long has the diarrhea been present for? So you can accurately frame it as either acute versus chronic. What are the characteristics of the stool? For example, is it watery versus bloody or with mucus? So you can start framing it as non-inflammatory versus inflammatory. Are other symptoms present, particularly fever, nausea, and vomiting, and abdominal pain? Another symptom to ask about is called tenismus, which is a sensation of needing to have a bowel movement when there is nothing actually right there ready to be expelled. This is typically seen with inflammatory diarrhea. In their past medical history, of particular importance is anything related to immunocompromise, 
which could place them at higher risk of unusual pathogens or at a higher risk of a more severe course. Also ask about recent infections of C. diff and ask about prior episodes of seemingly acute diarrhea in the event that the patient actually is presenting with chronic episodic diarrhea, which has an entirely different diagnostic framework. A medication history is essential, particularly asking about recent antibiotic use. Have they recently consumed any high-risk food, such as unpasteurized dairy, undercooked meat, or raw shellfish? Has there been any environmental exposures, particularly swimming in streams and lakes? And, as just discussed, a recent travel history. Moving to the physical exam, as always, start with the vitals and include orthostatics as a very rough screen for uh, volume depletion. The remainder of the exam should focus on further assessment of volume status and an abdominal exam. Unless the patient is unusually ill, has severe chronic disease of some kind, or there are unusual features in the history suggesting the diarrhea is a manifestation of a systemic disease, additional components of the exam are unlikely to be helpful. Diagnostic testing for patients with acute diarrhea is complicated by a variety of options, which are not equally available in all healthcare systems. Depending on where one practices, some of these may simply not be options, or due to their cost, may be reserved only for the sickest of patients. Among tests that may be considered are stool culture, which can identify most bacterial infections. Some U.S. hospitals now have available a multiplex panel that uses molecular methods such as PCR, to test for many different bacterial, viral, and protozoal pathogens all at once. Although such multiplex panels are extremely broad and convenient, one does need to be cognizant of the risk of false positives. Test for C. diff if the patient has risk factors for this. Different healthcare systems have different options for C. diff testing, including the possible inclusion of C. diff on the multiplex panel. In some situations of bloody diarrhea, particularly where a multiplex panel is not available, there may be utility in using stool microscopy to look for entamoeba. In patients with severe bloody diarrhea, a CBC can be helpful to ensure a patient is not developing significant anemia, as well as to look for thrombocytopenia that can be a sign of E. coli-associated hemolytic uremic syndrome. And in patients with unusually high volume diarrhea, a chemistry panel can look for associated electrolyte imbalances, particularly hypokalemia. Tests that are generally not indicated in acute diarrhea. Any form of imaging, endoscopy, fecal leukocytes, lactoferrin, calprotectin, or testing stool for occult blood. That last one on testing for occult blood might be a little debatable, but personally, if a patient's stool visibly appeared completely non-bloody, whether or not it was guaiac positive would not change my personal approach to them. Now let me show you a flowchart which summarizes my stepwise approach to acute diarrhea. The first question I consider is whether the patient has risk factors for C. diff, specifically relatively recent antibiotic use or previous C. diff infection. For this specific question, recent typically means within the last three months, give or take. If yes, test for C. diff, and if positive, you're done with the diagnostic workup. On the other hand, if the patient has either no risk factors for C. diff or testing was negative, next ask whether or not the patient has evidence of inflammatory diarrhea or severe disease irrespective of subtype. This includes severe abdominal pain, bloody stool, fever, and or hypovolemia. Consider whether they have any risk factors for a worse outcome. This includes age of 70 or above, advanced heart failure or pulmonary hypertension, which will make them more prone to hemodynamic instability with large changes in intravascular volume, significant immunosuppression, meaning diseases like HIV and organ transplantation, pre-existing inflammatory bowel disease, and pregnancy. And also consider whether there are any public health concerns related to the patient's presentation, meaning are they part of a new suspected outbreak of a foodborne illness. Despite many things being listed in this box, the majority of patients meet none of these criteria, in which case you should just monitor them and treat symptoms. If the patient improves, fantastic, you're done. If the illness is self-limited and outside of a major outbreak, 
there is no need to identify a specific pathogen. On the other hand, if the patient does not improve after several days, or if the patient has any of the preceding features, you should perform a stool culture and or a multiplex panel, if available. In addition, if the patient has bloody diarrhea, you should also consider direct testing for Shiga toxin as a quick screen for enterohemorrhagic E. coli, particularly if this is not included in an available multiplex panel. Also directly test for entamoeba, which might be a PCR test, ELISA test, or stool microscopy, depending on your healthcare system. Although this flowchart makes it seem like the preceding C. diff test and the subsequent tests are done sequentially, this more represents the thought process. In practice, if all these tests were indicated, they would all be ordered at once. In addition, regarding C. diff, it only rarely causes bloody diarrhea. Therefore, in the event that the patient has bloody diarrhea, C. diff risk factors and tests positive for C. diff, while initiating C. diff treatment, I would also look at these tests as well. If a diagnosis is made at this point, great, go ahead and treat. If not, monitor and treat symptoms. If the patient fails to improve after the following one to two weeks, consider the initiation of a workup for new onset chronic diarrhea. The key takeaway points for this video. Acute diarrhea can be classified as either non-inflammatory, which is characterized by watery bowel movements and minimal systemic symptoms, or inflammatory, characterized by bowel movements with either blood or mucus, and often fever or other signs of sepsis. The overall most common etiologies of acute diarrhea are neurovirus, campylobacter, and the various types of E. coli. C. diff is an important etiology among hospitalized and recently hospitalized patients. The majority of patients presenting with acute diarrhea do not warrant immediate testing. Patients who do warrant stool culture and or multiplex PCR plus or minus blood tests include those with inflammatory diarrhea, severe volume depletion, severe chronic disease, including immunosuppression, or those in situations in which an outbreak is suspected.